All right, everyone, I believe we are on to the, the sermon. Um, uh, Romans, we're in Romans chapter 8, 9 through 11 this week. Romans chapter 8, 9 through 11. Uh, so if you guys could just jump there uh, with your Bibles. Um, this week we're talking a little bit about the, the Holy Spirit and what effect he has when he takes up active residence in our lives. And, and if you guys remember last week, you know, last week's passage ended uh, in verse 8 on this note, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And right there, we should we should realize and recognize through that passage that in and of ourselves, we're in a lot of trouble, right? Um, and if we're trying to please God on our own, we are in a ton of trouble. Well, in fact, we can't do it. It's not possible, right? Um, we, we need uh, God's justification. We need his work in our lives. Um, and the Holy Spirit is, is the third person of the Trinity. He's the one that does that. He, he's the one that, that comes and makes his abode in us. He identifies us with Christ. And he actually helps us, enables us to actually obey. Actually obey in a pleasing way to our Heavenly Father. So let me read the passage, and then we'll, we'll kind of jump in. Um, verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So this week, right, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And as people, we have a tendency whenever we're dealing with any subject to go to extremes, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's some of us in this room that lean more to the side where we haven't really even thought about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, in a couple of weeks. There's those people out there, right? We, we, we don't give him much time. In fact, many people have, have called the Holy Spirit the forgotten person of the Trinity because a lot of people just don't think about his work, right, in our, in our lives. And then on the other side, there are those of us that if you don't get that, that good feeling when you worship or when you turn on Caleb in the car, you've had a bad day mm -hmm. because you rely on, on that feeling. You, you really need that. You look for that emotional uh, connection and touch with, with uh, the Holy Spirit of God working in your life. And if you don't feel that, you, you feel like you're missing something, right? And you've missed out on something. We're people that tend to lean to extremes. We lean one way or the other on a lot of issues in this, in this life, good or bad, right or wrong. That's what we tend to do. Uh, how does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? What's he there for? Uh, why does he reside in us, as this passage said? This is what this passage is going to, to explain to us, that, that the Holy Spirit wants to take up active residence in our lives, active residence so that, right, so that we can actually be pleasing to God and we can actually live in relationship with him. That's what this passage is about. So it, it's, it's more than, than just good feelings and good vibes in our lives. And it's more than just simply the residence of the Holy Spirit so we can say that, that we have believed in Jesus. He actively works in us to give us life, this passage says. But what do I mean by active residence? And I was thinking about this, and it's important that we kind of grasp this idea of active residence. When I was thinking about this, uh, what kind of popped into my mind was the, the idea of a caretaker, right? Imagine you got a caretaker on, on any like big manor home. Let's say that the residents are gone 11 months out of the year, right? Well, you can have a caretaker that's residing, but inactive. 
that that's there and he just sits around until the last week before they come back he lets the house get dusty and the garden overgrow and then he does everything really quickly so that he can uh make it a point when when his uh when the owners come home right um then you can have an active somebody in active residence it's like that caretaker caretaker that it's always working right it's always always doing something always keeping the house perfect just in case right that hit the owners of the home return and what we have in the holy spirit is we have someone of active residence in our lives and so for those of us that lean towards maybe not thinking uh, about the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives as much as we need to, we're the people that tend to forget, right, that he is supposed to be active, that he's there to be an active residence, to be always, uh, always doing something in our lives. There's a goal here. There's a goal here. The first thing we're told in this passage is that <clears throat> we, however, are not in the flesh anymore, because remember, the flesh can't please God, but we're in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So first and foremost, we see that the Holy Spirit resides in us so that, number one, we can please God. It's the first thing we see following verse 8 and into verse 9. He resides in us so we can act, act to actually please God. And how does that work? Uh, well, through the Spirit's, Holy Spirit's enablement, right, we can actually do good things, right? We can actually please God with our work. And now you may be taking, taking a moment and pausing and say, well, I know a lot of people, right? A lot of people that aren't believers, and they do a lot of good stuff. They're always volunteering. They're really great people. They do wonderful things. Are you telling me that, that they don't please God? And I would say, say no, right? And the reason I say that their good works don't please God is because they do it uh, apart from the right reason we should do good works, which is to give glory to God, right? That's why we should be doing good things, right? It's because we want to give glory to God through our love for other people, through our Christ-like attitude, through the way that we, we work in this world. We should be giving glory to God. We shouldn't be giving glory to ourselves. That's not the goal, right? We should be giving glory glory to him and that's what pleases god right our action focused on giving our worshipful action focused on bringing glory to god through our good works that's what pleases him right that's what brings him worship that's what brings him glory that's what gives god pleasure and so the Holy Spirit uh, making our spirits alive, living inside of us, is what actually enables us to, to worship God. It, it brings us from being people with a dead spirit, right, to one that's alive. Secondly, we see in verse 9 that the Holy Spirit is our identification as a Christian. It's, it's how we... I identify with Christ and with other believers. It says in the last half, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And so we see here that, that only people that have the Holy Spirit residing in them uh, know Jesus. And so don't let anybody tell you that, that after you are saved, after you've believed in Jesus, that you have to go through an extra step or do an extra thing to receive the Holy Spirit. Don't let anybody tell you that because it's not true and it's not reality. And that's out there. Right. That's out there. And, and in fact, for for a, a large part of, of my life, uh, not the whole time, but a few years there, I was actually uh, someone that that was had sat there and, and listened to that. Um, and it was a big struggle uh, for me. It's a big struggle. Uh, I went to a church that said, unless you, you spoke in tongues, uh, which for them was just simply unintelligible speech that that you didn't have the Holy Spirit, right? Um, 
the the problem with with that is is that's not, number one not what the Bible says is not what's located here in Romans, um, and, and it was it was hurtful, right? And it, it was it was damaging because it separated the church, right? It took a church that was together and it split them in the middle, those that had and those that had not. The Holy Spirit is something that we all have as believers, and it's one thing that binds us together as a group. You know why that we can, we can sit in a home and we can worship God just like we can in a church building? It's because the Holy Spirit is what's making this a church, right? The Holy Spirit is what makes us a church. It's what binds us together. It's what gives us our identification with Christ and with each other as believers. And that's so important that we make sure that we maintain our relationships with each other. Because a church is much more than a building, right? And, and our witness together is our witness to the world. So it identifies us as well. Moving on in verse 10, Paul writes, If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. We see here God's work in giving us life in our spirits. We, we learned in, in the previous passage, right, that our spirits were dead because of sin, right? We know that from the scriptures, that, that our spirits were, were not alive. We're facing, uh, facing eternal death, right, without God. But we see here that through the Holy Spirit of God, our spirit is made alive because of righteousness. And whose righteousness is this? This is the question here. Whose righteousness are we talking about? And uh, this is, I, I believe, Christ's righteousness. This is Jesus's righteousness. This is talking about our justification as believers. When Christ uh, made his sacrifice on the cross for us, he, he, took the penalty for our sins. And so what we're dealing with here is talking about penal substitutionary atonement. And so Christ, when we accept Jesus, he takes our sin, right? Because he's paid the price for that. And he gives us his righteousness. He bestows on us his righteousness so that in the sight of God, right, we can be actually justified in him. So we not only have freedom from our sins, but we have the righteousness of Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one that enacts that work in our hearts when we place our faith in Jesus. He's the one that opens our blinded eyes, that gives us sight, and allows us to truly live. To truly live. There are a lot of people in our world with, without, without much true hope, right? Mm -hmm. Without true purpose. And you see this, you see this all the time. You see this, especially with our, with our young people, right? Um, especially with our kids and teenagers. Uh, the search for meaning, the search for purpose, the search for, for life. And we see that, that through God's work, and only through God's work, can we actually find our true purpose in this world. Do you know why things like the Marvel movies are so popular and things like that, things like Star Wars and Marvel movies, why that's so popular with kids? Uh, why things like Frozen is so popular? That's one that I've been introduced to by my own children recently. Um, <laughs> Because they're stories about people with purpose, right? P stories about people that are fighting for something greater than themselves. That are living for something greater than themselves. And that's what people desperately need, right? 
Well, we as believers, we have that. We have the thing that is greater than ourselves, and it's living uh, for Jesus, right? It, it's living uh, in worshipful relationship with God, and we can do that. We can really live <laughs> with purpose and with hope and with meaning because Christ is in us, because the Holy Spirit resides in us, because we've been given Christ's righteousness. Because we have hope for the future. Our spirit's a very important part of us, right? But it's not the only important part of us. And in verse 11, we, we hear this, this verse here that deals with the body. It says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Um, so this is an important thing, too, that, that we learn and we grasp as we begin to, to deal with this passage and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. The importance of our bodies, right? We don't give a ton of thought of that, I, I don't think. Um, we, we don't give a ton of thought oftentimes to the importance of what it means to be human, right? Uh, what is a human? What, a human is, is someone created by God that has a spirit, right? And they also have a body. And why is that important? Well, the Corinthians uh, dealt with this, right? They dealt with this themselves. In fact, many of them were going and visiting temple prostitutes because they uh, thought the body just didn't matter, right? So they could do what they wanted to with the body, right? That was their, what they failed to grasp, right? They failed to grasp the importance of our bodies. In fact, they gave all their time and attention to their spiritual health and nothing to the body. If we forget about our bodies and the importance of our bodies, we've missed part of what it means to be human, right? And how do we do that? Uh, how, do, how do we model the Corinthian church in, in our time and in our day? Well, a lot of times for us believers, uh, we don't ever talk much about the resurrection, right? We think about going to heaven. We're okay with that, with our spirit, our soul going to heaven. But, but when's the last time we put our focus and, and our time and our energy to talking about the resurrection? They're talking about our bodies being raised from the dead because that's what we should be truly hoping for, more so than heaven, right? And you see this all the time on old graves. Go to an old graveyard sometime. It'll say, so-and-so waits in hope of the resurrection. And the reason that it says that, right, is because those people uh, identified the importance of our bodies and what it means to be human, right? Our bodies are part of us, right? They're something God made, and, and they're part of who we are. And so when we live in the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to have a body, right? It's going to be better than, than this one. It's going to be a glorified version of this one, but it's going to be our body. It's going to be who we are, right? And, and when we are, and when we realize the importance of that, I think it should affect our lives, right? should affect our lives. We, we should realize that we are people that, that much, must watch what we do. Not only what we put in our heads and in our spirits, but we should watch what we actively do with, with our bodies, right? How we treat ourselves, how we treat what God's given us. It's pretty important. And it's something that we don't often think about, but our bodies are so important that God's got to raise us from the dead. And that's something we should be hoping in. That's something we should be waiting for. And that's one thing that the Spirit of God does for us through His Spirit that dwells in us. He raises us from the dead. And so our hope, right? Our hope is in the resurrection. Our hope is in God raising us from the dead and us living with him forever as humans in all that it means to be human in this world that, that we love, right? But better, free of the the 
free of sin, free from the effects of sin on it. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful promise of the Holy Spirit, right? And so as we look to this promise, we realize that here and now we have a down payment of that, of the ultimate gift, freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from pain. We await those things. As we await those things, we have a down payment of it, and it's the Holy Spirit living in our lives. Let's give him significant honor in our hearts and in our lives. Let's also remember that that the Holy Spirit is there to point us to Jesus, right? He's there to point us to Jesus. He's there so that we can do good things that are actually pleasing to God. And what a wonderful gift that is. And so my prayer as we walk with this knowledge of the Spirit of God That we would be people that take the Holy Spirit that lives in us, take the life we've been given, take the hope of the future that we have, and that we could share that and bring that to other people. Number one, we can bring it to each other here in this room. Those of us that are, are bound together, right, in the gospel. Those of us that have a, a relationship um, simply because we are believers in Christ. And what a gift it is to minister to each other, to provide each other comfort and hope in all things. And we can do that with one another. We also have a hope and purpose that our world just doesn't know, right? We have comfort, we have peace, we have joy that our world just, just doesn't get. That we can bring to other people. That we can share with others. We can let people know that that don't have a hope. What our true hope and purpose should be. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, I I, uh, I am a, a church planner, but I also I also work as a hospice chaplain, um, and I do that for a large part of my week, right? And so every single day, every single day, I am. Uh, I'm dealing with with death, right? With people that that are passing away, and I'll I'll tell you, and I know this because I've been with hundreds of people that have faced that part of life. It's those that know their Savior, those that know Jesus, those that have the Holy Spirit residing in them, that approach that stage of life where we're really faced with whether we truly have hope or not for the future. They handle it much better than those that don't. There's a reason for that. It's because of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that has made their spirit of life alive and gives them a promise of hope to come. Mm-hmm. And we have that. Even if we, we don't often think about that every day, I don't think, but we have that. And there are people in, in our lives, whether they admit it or not, that are struggling with these ideas of purpose, are struggling with these ideas of hope, struggling with knowing why they're here and what they're here for. Only we have good answers to that. And that should give us cause. And when we do get the opportunity to speak to, into somebody else's life, that we do it. Because we are the, the only good answer that they're going to find. We, we hear a lot, right, about our world coming coming about by chance, right? By chance. 
and, and I've been studying this with a men's group that, that I, I lead early Sunday mornings. We, we get up at seven and, and meet. Um, but we've been talking a little bit about that, right? About what it means if our world really is here by accident. It means that we don't have hope. We don't have purpose. We don't have a future. And our children, right, are, are being taught this as gospel in our schools. You'll wonder why there's so much rampant depression and hopelessness and suicide. Because if we're just here by accident, it, if there is no one behind this story, if we're here by mistake, of course, because we have the Holy Spirit, we know that that's not true. But if we are, then there really is no hope. That's what the Holy Spirit brings to us through his work in our lives. So if he dwells in you today, praise God for that. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't, maybe it's time to consider. Consider Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word that, that challenges us to, to look and examine our lives. It teaches us to examine how we've been treating our, our, our spirits, how we've been treating our bodies. And Lord, we, we just pray that, Lord, you would use your word to, to challenge us this week. That we would take the comfort and hope we have and, and share it with each other and those around us as that need it. That we would remind ourselves every day that you are at work in our lives. That you care for us, that you are actively involved in our lives and you're actively residing in our hearts. Lord, we need that. We need that terribly. Because I know, Lord, we wake up a lot of days and, and we and we don't think about those things always, right? We forget we are busy. We go through our lives and, and get off to work and, and we forget that you have an active residence in us. Lord, let us not forget. Let us be people of joy and hope. Let us be people that please you with our actions, please you with our words and our thoughts. Help us and give us the ability to do that. Let us glorify you in every single thing we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for announcements today, it's a hang lot on, of... Hang on, hang um, on. Yeah. He, usually the pastor would stick around for questions or comments. That's true. We have been doing questions. Are you okay with that? Sure. We haven't kept it. It's okay. Go ahead, Sam. What's your question? So it's more like a comment. Remember, remember when you talked about how basically you said that people... That, that most churches would these days say you would have to do not only just have faith in Christ, but do X, Y, Z in order to, in order to go to heaven and stuff. Some churches do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not the case, like you said, but I think what is the case is the fact is, is like, you, you're familiar with Mosaic Art, right? Yep. Well, um, just like how Mosaic Art, you know, like has like a bunch of different pieces to fit together something and it's adaptable, like you can, like you can like use different pieces than the ones that are already in there to make the same thing. Sure. Um, that's, that's what I think what the gospel is and how and how like, you know, you could get, you could get to heaven because, you know, as long as you have faith in Jesus, the West is like mosaic on it. Like it's adaptable. No matter which way, which path you choose to go, you always, you will always be in glory, in glory with God as long as you believe in Jesus. That's the only because Jesus is the only thing that is that is like the constant thing in mosaic on it. But 
Do you get what I'm saying? I know. I know what you're saying. Our eternal, our security in Christ is an important thing. And it does give us a lot of peace and a lot of hope. And like, I'm just saying that, you know, like you believe in Jesus and the West is mosaic all that. <laughs> That's a good analogy, Sam. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Can I um, interject with your mosaic art? Yeah. What, imagine Hampton Beach being a mosaic art where each and every grain of sand is one tile in the mosaic. Who puts together the mosaic art at Hampton Beach? God does. Exactly. We are here to appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Like God puts this mosaic art piece together and you could go different paths as long as you believe in Jesus. Yep, that have that important, that important stuff. And the little baby playing in the sand appreciates it in one way. An artist appreciates it in another way. An oceanographer will appreciate it in a third way. They're all right. <laughs> yep. Amen. Any other questions before I so rudely jump ahead? <laughs> 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 yeah thank you all right so you're coming here again next week um we stay here